Many men, many women has a heart that's divided between their desire to serve God and their desire to be wealthy. Now, we don't like to think about that too much, let alone talk about it, but it's there, it's disturbing, and it hurts. How do you deal with that? How, how do you make a change for good? How do you get rid of that problem? I'm Bernie Diamond. Welcome again to Christianity Works. Really excited to be with you again this week as we head into the final message in this series called Money Matters, A Kingdom Perspective. And today's message is called A Change for Good. Now, I just want to spend a few minutes recapping, pulling together what we've been talking about over these last three weeks. I know, I know, you hear a preacher talking about money stuff and all of a sudden we become all sensitive and touchy because that that nerve that runs between the human heart and the wallet is the most sensitive nerve in the human body. And we've all seen these televangelists who fly around in private jets and, and live lavish lifestyles, and, and we want to be sick when we see that sort of stuff because the Jesus that you and I love is a Jesus who died with no assets, not with a BMW 7 Series in the driveway and a Rolex watch on his wrist, not even with the clothes on his back. He gave everything for you and me. And there's something that makes us sick about religion that aspires to this affluence and, and, and wealth versus Jesus who died for us with nothing. So I get that you may be a little bit uncomfortable with, with a preacher talking about money. And maybe the people who listened to Jesus were uncomfortable with him too. Because as I've said before in this series, Jesus spoke more about money, or indeed our attitude towards money, our relationship with money, than on any other subject. True. And the reason he did was that he knew that our attitude towards money could be a huge stumbling block. You see, even Jesus was tempted in this regard. Come with me to Luke chapter 4. The devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I can give to anyone whom I please. You see, that's the same temptation that the devil puts before us. Look at all the stuff the world has to offer. You can be successful. You can have this. You can have that. You can live in a big house. You can drive an expensive car. What's the matter with us? that we buy a $50,000 car when a $20,000 car will work perfectly well? What's the matter with us that we have to live in a massive house with rooms that we don't even go into when a small apartment will do? And so this desire for wealth, this greed, drags us away from God because Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. You'll either serve one or the other, but you can't serve both. You can't serve both God and your desire for wealth. That's what Jesus said, and it's true. And I, I'm an expert in this. I, I can give you firsthand, because when I was a young man, I believed in Jesus. In my high school years, I believed in Jesus with a passion. And yet, as I went out of the workforce, became an army officer, aspired to wealth, started my own business, wanted to be successful, wanted more and more and more and more and more, I did have the big house that, that we didn't go, have rooms that we didn't go into. I did have the expensive $70,000 car, which back in the early 90s was a massive amount of money to spend on a car. I remember the alluring smell of the fresh leather and the beautiful, beautiful, smooth burgundy duco. And yet, this desire for wealth which drove me caused me to sacrifice my family, it caused me to sacrifice my health, it caused me to sacrifice my relationship with God, to the point where the desire for wealth drew me away from God, to the point where my relationship with God was all over, to the point where I became so desperate and so empty that I almost took my own life. You see, here's the thing, 
We want wealth for two reasons. We want wealth for the stuff that it can buy, and we want wealth because we think that gives us financial security. But the stuff we can buy can never satisfy us. It might give us a te temporary hit the way a heroin addict gets a hit when they, when they take some heroin. But that's it. Stuff never, ever satisfies you. Stuff never, ever fills you up. It only drains you and makes your life more brittle and vacuous and empty. And we want money for the security we think it'll buy. And yet Jesus said, don't store up for yourself treasures here on this earth where moth and rust can destroy, where thieves can steal and break in. Instead, store up for yourself treasures in heaven. Moth and rust cannot destroy, where thieves cannot break in, where no one can rob you of your inheritance in Christ. Focus your life on living for Christ, not for stuff. Because your assets that you build up here, firstly, none of them are secure. Stock markets crash. Houses burn down. Banks fail. I don't want to be the harbinger of, of doom and gloom, but that's the reality, right? And even if you have this amazing lot of wealth, one day you'll be the person in the casket at the front of the church and none of that will matter anymore. It just hits me every time I take a funeral or I attend a funeral, whatever that person has accumulated here on this earth is now completely meaningless. It's completely worthless to them. And so we read in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Through their eagerness to become wealthy, many have wandered away from their faith and pierced themselves with many pains. That's what happens, my friend, when we chase after money for what it can buy and for the security that we think it's going to bring us. So what's the antidote to that? How do we break free from this addiction? Last week in the program, we met that widow. I want to come and see her again today. Luke chapter 21, verses 1 to 4. Jesus looked up and saw all these rich people putting their gifts into the treasury. He also saw a poor widow who put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. All of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in all she had to live on. Now, this is a radical story. I'm not going to go through all that we talked about last week. If you missed last week's program, you'll find it on the website. The point is this. The, the widow trusted God enough to be able to put in all she had to live on, knowing that God would provide for her, knowing that God would bless her generosity. Sacrificial, generous giving is what excites Jesus. He didn't get excited about the guy's who gave lots and lots of money. Now, maybe some of them did give sacrificially. Great. What got him excited was the widow who gave only this much, but gave all that she had to live on. In my journey over the last quarter of a century walking with Christ, I began with a very unhealthy relationship with money. I, all my security was tied up in my money. And, and there came a point, which is the point at which I came to Christ, where I lost almost everything, not quite, but almost everything, through no fault of my own. It was a terrible time, this, this time of terrible financial insecurity. And then I started going to church, and they were talking about giving, and I'm thinking, you have to be kidding me. Look at where my life is. I've lost almost everything I have. I only kept one asset, in fact, my ownership in my company, everything else I lost. And little by, by little bit, God taught me about giving about generous, sacrificial giving. Giving in such a way that if I give this money to God's work, I will miss out on something. That's sacrificial giving. I would rather do this, but I'll give there and I'll miss out on that. And over this last quarter of a century journey with Jesus, you know what that's done? As He's taken me to new levels of giving and new levels of giving. He set me free from my addiction to money. I, I didn't realize that was what was going on. Now, there are different ways of giving. For instance, when I left my secure consulting career, which was a six-figure salary, it was very lucrative, it promised a lot, and I went into the ministry, I went from earning this much to earning this much. See, that's a step of faith. It wasn't an easy step. I'm not telling you I did it because I'm a great guy. It was a hard step. 
But God has been faithful. And I now earn much less than I ever earned, than I could be earning now. But I'm much richer. I'm much more blessed. I'm much wealthier. Not financially, but full of joy, full of peace. Actually content with what God's got me doing. See, God blesses it when we put our whole financial structure on a missional footing. Now, some people want to tell you, you just have to tithe. Malachi chapter 3, you know, you bring in your tithe. In fact, let's go and have a look at it. Will anyone rob God? Yet you're robbing me. But you say, how are we robbing you? In your tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. So people go to that scripture and they go, that's why you should tithe. You should give 10% of your income to God's work. Therefore, you should tithe and God will bless you. But I want to remind you that these people were under the Old Testament law. You and I are no longer under the law. We're under grace. That's what the Bible clearly teaches. And so you and I are no longer obliged to give a tithe. Mind you, when I go to New York City, I have to tip the taxi driver 16 to 18%, maybe 20%. God doesn't want a tip. God doesn't want a tithe. God wants you to put your whole financial situation on a missional footing. How much did Jesus give for you? He gave everything. God wants you to put everything on the line. For me, that meant leaving my career and taking a much lower paying job and trusting God because there was no money to pay me. That's, that's my journey. That's my story. It was hard. I felt really insecure, but God has taught me so much through that. James L. Kraft, who founded the, the global conglomerate, the Kraft Food Empire, once said this. He said, I don't believe in tithing. Although, I guess it's not a bad place to start. Tithing's a great principle. It, it is. It's a great place to start with your giving. Because tithing is a good chunk of your discretionary income, normally. But don't leave it there. Give generously. Be like the widow. Be like Jesus, who gave his all for you. I said a couple of weeks ago on the program that the difference often between a believer and a disciple is their attitude towards money. Say it again. The difference between a believer, someone who says, yeah, sure, I believe in Jesus, but then goes merrily along their way and lives their life, and a disciple who takes up their cross and follows Jesus wherever he calls, no matter what it costs, the difference often between those two is their attitude towards money. Would you like to be set free from your worry about your financial future? Would you like to be set free from your addiction to money and your desire for wealth and your eagerness to be wealthy, it's easy. Start giving generously and sacrificially. Well, it's not easy. The idea is easy. Doing it ain't. Doing it's hard. Doing it's scary sometimes. But let me tell you, your God will always bless you. Your God will always provide for you. And your God will set you free from your desire for wealth. I'd just like to take this short moment to remind you that you can receive the fresh daily e-devotional each day into the inbox on your smartphone, tablet, or computer. A powerful scripture verse and some words of inspiration, hope, and encouragement to help you grow in your relationship with Jesus, to help you receive his word into your heart every day, to help you put your roots deep down in his truth so that your life will bear fruit. It's God's Word, fresh for you today. You can receive your free copy. You can sign up to receive that fresh daily e-devotional every day at the homepage of our website. Right at the top there, just pop in your name and email and it'll start winging its way into your life. And you'll also receive a free copy of the e-book, How Can I Hear God Speak to Me? That's all at our website. May you be blessed as you receive God's Word into your heart. So how are you coping with all of this discussion about money? It can be confronting, can't it? And, and it can be uncomfortable, it can make you squirm because the easiest thing to do in the world is to ignore everything that Bernie just said. 
to ignore everything that I've just shared with you over these past few weeks from the scriptures. And please, if you've missed any of the episodes, go back to the website, ChristianityWorks.com, and you'll be able to watch all the programs there on, on this series, Money Matters, A Kingdom Perspective. The easiest thing is to go, yeah, I agree with the theory, but in practice, I'm just going to keep all my money to myself. What, what does that guy know? I mean, it's great for him, but, but hey, I believe in Jesus. My future's assured. I'm just going to keep spending my money the way I spend my money. And yeah, from time to time, I'll worry about my financial future, but that's just part of the game. It's the easiest thing to do. But the Bible is really clear. I've shared with you from the Word of God that Jesus calls, up, calls us not to lay up treasures for ourselves here in, on this earth, where moth and rust can destroy, where thieves can break in and steal, but to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Not to worry about what we're going to eat, drink, where, or where we're going to live, but to trust in God, to first seek after the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all this other stuff will be added unto us, all of it. Everything we need. God knows what you and I need. So God calls us as a result of those two things to be sacrificial givers. We saw it in Exodus chapter 25 and chapters 35 and 36 where God commanded Moses to go and say to the people to give all those who had a heart to give and they gave generously. Do you know the Jewish people still today amongst their own are incredibly generous we have this maybe ill-informed stereotype that Jewish people are tight people. They're prudent with their money. They're good investors. They're financially very savvy. But amongst their own, they are incredibly generous. Do you know why? Because right from the beginning, Exodus chapter 25, God taught them a culture of generosity. God taught them a culture of trusting in Him. God doesn't want you to trust in your wealth. Nor does he want you to worry about your wealth. God wants you to trust in him and know that whatever may come, he will look after you. He will provide for you. He will be there for you. Let's go to a familiar passage because I know some of this is confronting. Hebrews chapter 4 verse Indeed, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the human heart. And before him, no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. And that's the bottom line. However you choose to spend your money on this earth, one day, you are going to have to render an account. I am going to have to render an account. As I look back on the process of, of putting my finances on a missional footing, of, of changing jobs, of earning much less, and yet still being much richer, I at the struggles and the fears and the worries and all the times God showed up and bailed me out because I had trusted in him. I look forward now to the day when I have to give an account. And I'm in this place not because I'm a good guy. I'm in this place because God led me there. And I believe that God is leading you to that place now too. How? Through his word. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing until it divides the soul from the spirit, the bone from the marrow. It judges the thoughts and the intentions of the human heart. See, as we've spent this time together in this series, maybe just today, if this is the only program you've watched, I know that the Word of God is niggling away at you. The Word of God is so sharp. God wants to set you free from your addiction to wealth. God wants to set you free from your worry about finances and money. And the only way that I can help you to do that is to share the Word of God with you. See, Jesus has been through everything that you and I have been through. Have a listen. Verse 14. Since then we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who in every respect has been tested or tempted as we are, yet was without sin. See, Jesus has struggles about finances. 
He didn't have a big bank balance when he stepped out and left the carpenter shop and these fishermen left their businesses and they followed him. We know he had an offering, a treasury, because Judas plundered that treasury and robbed from it. Jesus had to rely on his Father in heaven to support him. So since he has been tested and tempted in every way as we are, we know that he went through these struggles too. He had to learn to trust his Father too. And his father never let him go hungry, never let him starve, led him to the cross, let him be killed, and then raised him from the dead again. In fact, Jesus knew that he could even feed the 5,000 with two fishes and five loaves because of the power of God. Jesus gets it. Jesus understands where you are at right now. So, so what? So what do we do with this next verse? Let us therefore, because Jesus gets it, because Jesus has been there, because Jesus understands the temptation to chase after money or to feel insecure about where his next meal is coming from, because he gets that, therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need with boldness. Go to God with boldness. God, I have a bad attitude towards money. I have a wrong attitude towards money. I need you to help me. I need you, God, to set me free. Lord, I don't have enough to put food on the table for my family tomorrow. Dick Jenkins, the founder of Kalo in the USA, tells a story when he started the first radio station. Remember, Kalo is now this massive radio network. Back when he first started it, and he stepped out in faith, and they had no money, and they had no support, there came a point where they had no food for the kids. They, they couldn't feed enough. So he and his wife sat down on the kitchen floor, crying, prayed to God, cried out to God knock on the door, someone from church with a food basket, saying, I just, just felt to bring this to you. See, that's your God. That's my God. That's what God does. Go boldly before the throne of grace. Don't be afraid to go to God and say, I'm inadequate. I don't have the resources. I don't know what to do. I'm afraid. Be bold. And, and why are we bold before the throne of grace? So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the God whom we serve. So what's the answer? How do we make a change for good? How do, we, how do we get to the point of actually living this stuff out? I want to leave you with a passage of scripture at the end of this series that, that gives the best advice that I've ever seen to living in financial security. Let's go to it. 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning at verse 17. As for those who in the present age are rich, and let me tell you, if you have a roof over your head, if you have food on the table, if you have clothes on the back, you are rich. I know we live in a generation where everyone says, I don't have enough. We manifestly have enough. And if you have enough to do those things, you are by any global standard rich. So this is to you. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. Don't let your wealth make you proud and swagger around and say, look at what I have. There are too many people who do that. Too many people who call themselves Christians who do that. Don't let your wealth make you proud. Because you know, I know, that pride always comes before the fall. Don't let your riches make you haughty. And don't set your hopes on the uncertainty of riches. Remember, we've talked about that. Jesus explained that riches are uncertain. As much as we think that stock portfolio is going to see me through, stock markets crash. As much as we think, wow, that house of mine is going to give me security. Hey, I've been in a place where I lost my house 27 years ago. I don't care what riches you have and how certain they appear to you, they are uncertain. Do not put your hope and your trust in riches which are uncertain but rather on God who richly provides us everything for our enjoyment. When God gives it to you, when God blesses you with it, you're going to enjoy it. The rich are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that really is. Two things there. Be generous, give, support, lay up for yourself a foundation for the future because God will bless your future in this world and in eternity. That, that's the first thing. And secondly, notice how it ends up, this passage, so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. 
so that you can end up living life to the full. Speaking of someone who once tried to be rich and found life hollow and empty and unsatisfying, and who now has far less and finds life rich and a blessing, I can tell you, taking hold of the life that God has for you by being generous, by being rich in good works, is the single most satisfying thing you can do with your life. Friend, don't be duped by this idea that having stuff makes you happy. It doesn't. God has a life waiting for you, and he wants to set you free from the tyranny of wealth. Amen, Father. I pray for each one of us, Lord. I pray that your word today would really penetrate our hearts, Lord, that you would set us free from the tyranny of wealth and from the worry over money and help us to lay hold of the life that really is life. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Look, I pray that you've been blessed through this series. Next week we'll kick off a new series of messages. But this series is available on our website. I pray that if if you haven't watched all the programs, please do, because I know that your God, my God, wants to set us free from the tyranny of wealth. May God bless you richly as you've received his word today. Just before we go, I'd like to remind you that each month here at Christianity Works, we publish a new life application booklet. To see the current one, stop by at the homepage on our website. The details are on your screen right now. And towards the top of the homepage, you'll see the current free booklet offer. You see, this is all about taking you deeper into God's word. At the end of each chapter, you'll see some life application questions to help you think through and pray through what you've just learned to bring real transformation into your life as you receive the word of God into your heart. So grab your free e-booklet from the homepage on our website right now. I'm Bernie Diamond. You've been watching Christianity Works and I'll catch you again same time next week with another message of God's love, God's grace and God's power for each one of us in Jesus Christ. Hey YouTube, if you are blessed through today's message, then click on this button and subscribe to the Christianity Works YouTube channel and continue being blessed and empowered through the Word of God each and every day.